The failed fire festival was a big deal when it happened. I first heard about it by watching the internet historian's video, and I thought he did a funny take on it. So when I saw that there was a documentary about the fiasco, which came out about two years after his YouTube video, then I decided to give it a watch. Unsurprisingly, the real poo storm behind the fiasco was much more ridiculous than a short, funny YouTube video can detail. Yet, as I started working on editing my review, I began to realize something important, something which I had not given enough of a critical eye to. While the long film does throw many more facts at you than the internet historian does, it also strangely misses some key points which he did bring up, such as this. The standard price was around $1,200. Which, if you think about two weeks in the Bahamas with practically all of your expenses taken care of, that's pretty bloody good. In fact, some tickets were as low as $500. I thought that there was at least a line or two clearly citing the pricing tiers, but there wasn't. I rechecked. The film did mention the expense of tickets and how much they cost, but not the cheap ones. There was a line about the tents, but I saw nothing on their pricing. In other words, the internet historian was better and clearer on this very basic point about who got scammed with the fire festival and for how much. This was an odd contrast with the film at best. They also both mentioned the most expensive ticket available and again, the internet historian was factual and the documentary was, at best, misleading. There's no proof whatsoever that anyone purchased a $250,000 ticket. I also tried to find out if anyone bought a $250,000 thousand dollar ticket and just as he did i found no evidence that it was actually sold and really it was on the so-called documentary to show evidence of that the filmmakers implying it was sold and showing no proof went up to like 250 grand for you know a private yacht with a, a private chef on board within 48 hours they sold 95 percent of their tickets aren't staying on yachts, at least most of them aren't, was, again, odd at best. The internet historian was also more balanced in how he showed the attendees. In contrast, much of the film's footage showed the attendees in an unsympathetic light. This is off-putting when you think about it. After all, Fire Festival was a disaster because it screwed people over. How can a documentary about it not be thorough when it's discussing who got screwed and for how much? Plus, why bother showing stuff that reinforces the false perception of attendees? and then not address that false perception. The way it's shown, well, it underlines the false perception instead of refuting it. You feel bad for the people that did spend money and go to this? <laughs> if you had thousands of dollars to go on a trip to see Blink-182, uh, <laughs> that's on you. That is Darwinism at its finest. <laughs> Why not just show clear information, like the internet historian did here? Wait a minute. Up to $250,000 a ticket is too low. In fact, on social media, people were so merciless and unsympathetic towards the guests because they thought it was a bunch of rich kids paying for tickets with a starting price of $12,000. And you can thank fake news for that assumption. I wondered why a YouTuber could clearly show such important basic details in his much shorter, lighthearted video. Yet a so-called documentary seemed to miss such points entirely. It's an odd contrast, but it's also important to note the vast differences between both pieces of content in both scope and resources. On one side, I'm talking about a random guy from New Zealand who makes videos on his own for fun, and he posts them online for free. On the other, I'm talking about a film that made its way to Netflix, with many people behind it, a bigger budget, and it was also made for profit. It wasn't just made for fun. It's also supposed to be a documentary. The film's also much longer than his video. It's about an hour and a half longer. With that combo of runtime and resources, Issues as important and very core, such as ticket pricing, should have been clearly conveyed. That means that there's a big and simple question to answer. How could they miss it? How could they let the internet historian, a YouTuber, show them up two years before they even release their film? The answer? In retrospect, I think that they missed the mark on many points because it's not really a documentary. I think it's a shady PR piece masquerading as a documentary. I think this because I looked into it further. If you look at Wikipedia, you'll find a hint of problems. The social media company that promoted the Fire Festival was a co-producer. However, even if you look at Wikipedia, then you're still not seeing the depth of how far the PR spin goes. As I looked more into the matter, I found more. I 
I think that the Wikipedia page itself has been made part of the spin and turned into a heavily biased entry to promote the film. After all, managing one's image is the field of business we're discussing here. And it's not too odd that such a business would do the same thing that they sell for themselves. There's some evidence for this on the Wikipedia page itself, too. As you can see, the page contains much praise, yet it entirely fails to report serious problems. The weirdest thing is on the citation side. Look at the citations and then compare what's being cited to the titles of what they cite. The titles and the sources are negative, and yet the way they're cited is in a sort of sideways way, as if a bland detail or two was the primary info they contained. Being heavily biased is against Wikipedia's rules, because matters such as the following are important to know. After early screenings at Cannes in May 2018, Smith took Fire to Netflix, which announced its acquisition of Fire on December 10. Netflix said that the movie was directed by Smith and that the executive producers were Elliot Tabelli and James Oliger from Jerry Media, Gabrielle Bluestone of Vice, and Max Pollock, Matthew Rowan, and Brett Kincaid of Matt Projects. So by the time of Netflix's announcement, the producer list had become dominated by personnel from companies contracted directly by Fire Festival. The show was run by Matt Projects, Swigen's employer, which owned most of the behind-the-scenes footage you see in Fire, and Jerry Media itself. Although the Vice logo appears in the movie's credits, the company seems to have been edged out. So I suspect shenanigans. Similarly, the Wikipedia article for Jerry Media is short, biased, and it doesn't really cover the severe criticism and controversy that surrounded the company. Even their ties having been cut with Comedy Central is given a rather positive view, saying that somebody only wanted to correct things and not the criticisms that they received that led to that statement is biased. I agree with the New Republic article. It does seem that the Fire film successfully fooled many people, just as the original Fire Festival did. In the festival's case, attendees expected music and got lies. In this case, viewers expect an unbiased documentary and get duped. Though, at least you probably won't be stranded on an island in a locked airport if you buy into what the film tells you. That did happen with the actual festival. The airport was totally overwhelmed with all these people and they eventually locked them in uh, and kept them overnight without any food or water. All of that said, it is still well produced for a PR piece, I've got to give it that. It's entertaining. I can see why most people would likely not think it was a PR piece and could be fooled into thinking it's legit. If you're watching it uncritically, then it spits out so many facts and crazy stories that it seems legit. It has a lot of insider info. It being listed as a documentary in the first place also gives it an air of credibility too. Add all of that onto a tested by time story format and it becomes slickly produced. To be slickly entertaining, it follows a very old, very successful format, that of a Greek tragedy. Whoever chose the story structure for the film made an excellent choice because the disastrous festival fits into the story structure remarkably well. They do have to tweak some things, but the tweaking is subtle and it works. They tweak reality to fit their hero and modernize the Greek chorus as well. The first thing that needs changing is is the protagonist, Billy. The word hero meant something different to the ancient Greeks. An ancient Greek hero was simply a protagonist with lofty goals, but who was brought down by a fatal flaw called hamartia. His or her flaws made the hero seem human, relatable, somebody who the audience could sympathize with. Hubris, excessive pride, was a common flaw for the heroes. To fit that format, the film posits that this was why Billy lied often. It also paints him as a deeply insecure man. This framing is important to note, because it makes Billy a sympathetic character, and that follows the old format. Nerdy, but like clearly smart, clearly like an incredible entrepreneur. I loved his vision, I loved his ideas, his energy. It just became much more than anybody ever dreamed it would be. I mean, you know the saying, desperate people do desperate things. This was Billy's charm. Like Billy could just sell you on anything. He's an operational sociopath. That shit was so far away from what he knew and what he experienced in his life, that the cognitive dissonance just led him to say, I'm not going to jail. People want to have access and they want exclusivity. Fire was basically like Instagram come to life. Billy seemed really, really invested in that whole lifestyle. Completely out of his depth and he's, uh, unfortunately for himself, a compulsive liar uh, and someone that at the end, you know, should be held accountable. 
thing that guy's good at, it's separating consumers from their cash. Uh, and if there's anything that this, this country celebrates more than that, I don't know. I actually wouldn't be surprised if 10 years down the line we're going to be hearing about Billy McFarlane starting some kind of other venture that's, you know, imaginative and, uh, and gets some serious momentum. However, I don't think that it makes good arguments here. The way they paint him is clear, though. It also tweaks the ancient Greek chorus and modernizes it. Instead of singing all together or chanting as a literal chorus, interview clips are used to fill the choir members' roles, and each member speaks individually. This makes sense, since in a modern documentary, lyric meters in interviews would be odd, and so would all of them speaking simultaneously. By the way, though, this also means that in a Greek tragedy-like tale about a music festival, there's not much actual music. When you consider how the fire Festival actually wound up, that twist is actually perfect. The interviewees do check many of the same boxes. In an ancient Greek tragedy, the chorus served many roles, but they were primarily narrators and an emotional connection for the audience. They would add details, context, and further set the mood for the story. Often they lament losses and describe feelings of despair. They were the ideal spectator altogether taken as an actor in their own right. Even the way the interviewees are filmed, which is called the Talking Heads format, has the interviewees similarly narrating the tale, speaking both directly and emotionally to the audience. They're also all filmed in this way, which, even though they're separate, makes them seem to come together overall as an individual whole. Sort of like seeing the forest for the trees. If you zoom out and take them all in context, they do all seem like one unit. I think that's a clever modernization. Now, on to how it all plays out like a play. The tale begins with the prologue, complete with expositional dialogue. It's the biggest event in a decade, I promise you. It was just the coolest party that you'd ever seen advertised. It's become one of the most talked about dramas on social media. Island getaway turned disaster. Quickly spiraling into chaos. It just became much more than anybody ever dreamed it would be. I mean, you know the saying, desperate people do desperate things. Then you have the Parados, which is basically just an extended prologue. Well, I'm gonna let my, my partner in crime here, Billy McFarlane, give y'all an introduction of what fire is. Once the Parados is done, then you have the first Stasimon. This is when the chorus acts as an ideal spectator, narrator, and moral compass. Throughout the documentary, the chorus tells the hero that his beliefs are wrong. You kind of have to think about toilets. We have to buy a bunch of toilets. We gotta go to like Home Depot and buy a thousand <laughs> toilets, right? Beg him not to rush towards disaster. The number of tickets they had sold, they just couldn't physically fit that many people on the island, let alone build out some sort of incentive insane infrastructure that could support them from a bio-waste standpoint. And yet they are all ignored. Billy at some point told me, you need to step back. We're gonna go with different people. I wasn't the only one that was kind of changed out in, uh, in February, March. Just as a Greek chorus would be in a tragedy as they warn of what's to come. They're just narrating. Behold, we are the Greek chorus. We narrate this epic tale of stupidity. After the Stasimon's done with, then there's an episode. An episode shows action. A good way to think of the two is regrets and what happened. Please don't do it. He did it. It would be stupid if he did. He did it. A Greek tragedy slips back and forth between the two until the show's over. Eventually, the leader can no longer change course because, like most protagonists in Greek tragedies, his excessive pride gets in the way. This pride has led him to deny reality until things reach a critical point. He's made stupid mistakes and they're gonna culminate. As things unfold in that direction, the chorus's job is to say, I told you so, and underline that the audience shouldn't make the same mistakes, that viewers shouldn't be like so-and-so was. As for the episodes, when things hit the fan, these moments of action are shown through footage of the past. Lastly, there's the exodus. The exodus is simply the end of the play. It's when the chorus wraps things up and leaves. Viewing it all as a Greek tragedy also tickles me a bit because I think seeing it that way is hilariously wonderfully apt. The first tragedies were performed at a festival for Dionysus, the ancient Greek god of wine and wild times. A tale about a drunken party gone wild to the point of feral really fits that god's history. But make no mistake, despite the humor involved, it's still a dark humor because real people were hurt by this festival's failure. The fire festival failing harmed those who were roped into creating it, especially when it came to the locals. 
I'd say they got screwed over the most out of everyone. It also harmed those who worked for the company, but weren't even tied to the festival. There was a software division that was working on an actual product, and this festival made their work rather pointless, and it was about a year of their lives. But while the film mentions those parts, it skips and spins other parts. For example, I said earlier that it doesn't mention the people who weren't rich being scammed. Remember, some people got tickets for $500 and others paid about $1,200. We're not talking about spoiled rich kids when we're talking about those kinds of prices. Many attendees saved up for a nice vacation that they normally wouldn't get to go on. It was supposed to have everything included, so it was a rather good deal that they were expecting to get, and they got screwed. It's also disturbing that while the film ignores those people entirely, it does show people viewing things in an incorrect, unsympathetic sort of light. That's disturbing because the way it's presented doesn't address the false perception at all and instead seems to underline and shove it forward. This promotes the spin that no attendees really suffered because they'll return to their pampered lives in a moment. They only bought tickets because they had extra money <laughs> lying around anyway. Nobody normal, nobody like most of the audience who would be relatable, got screwed. You can even listen to a guy talking about selfishly peeing on beds to claim territory like a wild animal. Our strategy from there was to kind of ransack all the tents around us. We just started poking holes and flipping mattresses and my buddy pissed on a few of the beds. Which would mean that some people had to sleep on the ground due to this behavior. All I know is that by the end of the night, all of the tents were full. And this is with one third of the guests we were supposed to have. Why not interview a single one of those people? I'm sure that the filmmakers could have found people in stories which the audience could have connected with better, sympathized with more, but none were shown for balance. This view seems skewed to me. Plus, the contractors behind the film also claim that they were entirely duped. And effectively photoshopped out the bottom portion of the map to make it look like they were on a deserted island. I thought the world has got to know what's going on. So I create the now infamous Twitter account uh, fire fraud. Nothing happened. I got maybe two or three clicks uh, on Twitter, and that was it. What we ended up doing was taking a uh, plane down there and photographing the development. I realized very quickly that there was no way that these guys were going to be able to pull this off. The media and marketing companies in New York, we didn't have any visibility into what was happening on the production side. We just started getting bombarded with all of these questions. Grant was trying to use our employees for customer service, but that wasn't what we were hired to do. The only thing we could do was to just keep telling people, email concierge at fire.com, and then you would have Grant reaching out and saying, these comments are killing us. What do we do about all the people that are talking shit? The decision was to screenshot all of the legitimate questions and forward that over to the fire team, and then delete all of the negative comments that were degrading the brand. I saw them actively deleting comments and then turning comments off entirely so that you wouldn't have 3,000 people saying, hey, I don't have my flight information. Where do I need to go? If you're asked as a media company to start deleting things, you that's a red flag. Flag words about lineup, lineups, performers, details, info, flights, fraud, stupid, scam, festival even. Festival was blocked, it got that bad. They would say, hey, like, I haven't gotten my flights confirmed, what's going on? And it would be, the person would then get blocked from the account. They were so good at silencing the dissenters that I'm screaming this from a rooftop and there's no one listening. Their pleading total ignorance, I think, is questionable at best. They also don't fairly present questions about their past integrity to the audience or underline that they're currently the ones behind the camera. This continued lack of fair, balanced presentation makes me question them more, not less. Is this the actual full story? I really doubt it, considering that you could boil all of that info down to marketing really good, really bad. After all, they would have a strong temptation to clean up their reputations and underline how good their marketing is, and that is exactly what this film does. When that can be spotted, the documentary as a whole seems, uh, let's just say, murky. While the tale is presented in an entertaining way, all of that makes it seem like a tall tale at best. On top of all of that, the film portrays Billy as flawed, desperate, and sympathetic. This portrayal is questionable as well. Billy himself 
was reported as wanting a documentary to be made because he supposedly thought that it could help clean up his own image. Given what happened and what he chose to do along the way, I think that the film does present him in a strange, pitying sort of light. I could see that there were tears in his eyes, but that was the first time that any of us had seen that through thick and thin he stayed so positive, and it wasn't until that day. That said, I also didn't like the way that it blamed him for every single problem either. While it's clear that Billy wasn't listening to the people he hired, and he charged ahead even when he obviously shouldn't have, I think putting all of what was bad onto one person, onto Billy, is a bad argument. I don't think that he was the sole reason everything went wrong, and that everybody else was just innocent sheep. When everything's said and done, the way things played out with the Fire Festival really does lend itself well to the structure that the filmmakers decided to go with. The hubris, the allure, the failure, the human costs, the journey to the festival, and the complicated return home for the attendees and workers. When they realized this thing come to abrupt stop, they all leave those rent cars running with the keys and the ignition. I want to, one guy said they couldn't, like the door couldn't get open. The lady take her foot and kick the door and run up in the airplane. It has a lot of good story elements baked into it, but it feels as if the documentary should say based on a true story instead of being called a documentary. The film doesn't feel like a documentary to me, but instead feels like a sketchy PR piece. I also feel that I wasted my time watching it for that reason. Knowing what was omitted and who chose to omit it makes the film feel gross to me, and I strongly dislike it as a result. On a final note, although I already kind of underlined it, props to the historian for actually being factual and good in his short sort of mini documentary. I am linking to that in the description. I recommend it, but I don't recommend this documentary.